Hello again, folks. We're going to embark on another two-part project series. And again, it's going to be sponsored by our friends over at PCB Way. And what we're going to do in this particular series is we're going to build upon uh, the circuit that we designed and built in our previous one, and that is the fast rise time oscillator. The reason for that is uh, what we're going to build is a related item. It's called a time domain reflectometer. Now, the time domain reflectometer requires a nice fast rise time. It doesn't have to be as nice or as fast as for the fast rise time oscillator, but it does need to be pretty fast and it does need to be fairly well controlled. So we're going to start off with basically the same circuits we had there with the oscillator, the buffer, and the output section. We're modifying the output section here for a little bit more drive and a little bit less damping. The reason we want a little bit more drive is because what a reflectometer does is it passes a signal down along a cable, usually a cable of some known intrinsic impedance, and then looks for a reflection coming back. And depending on the reflection it gets back, that will determine if there is or what kind of fault is in the cable. These are very, very handy for people working with antenna systems, working with twisted pair network cables. When they get a fault or if they want to find out how long a particular connection is, or this is what you use a time domain reflectometer for. Before we get too far, let's go on over to our sponsor and pay them a visit go over to PCB Way here. And I just wanted to go, you know, just to give you the scope of the services that PCB offer. It, it's quite amazing. Of course, they, they do offer PCBs. On top of that, they offer mechanical services too. And you can see here the list of them, CNC machining, 3D reprinting, sheet metal fabrication, injection molding. If you're designing and building a product, whether it's a prototype or you're even looking to do some uh, small production runs, uh, this is the perfect way to go about it. But what I'm interested in right now is, is 3D printing. And you come over here and the page is kind of similar to what we had before with the PCB boards. I'll show you what I want to have done. Take your files, drop them on here and I'll load them up. Now you can go over, they have a 3D viewer and you can have a look at them. Now what these are, these are card cage for an Altair 8800. If you can picture this, this would be the base of it um, here. And this is where the cards run in along here. And there'll be one on each side. I can't make these at home, but I can get them printed by PCB Way. So I'm going to, and shortly, I don't know if I'll make a video on it, um, but maybe I will. But once you've got your, your files in there, and this happens to be STL format, they take some other ones too. We could, we could look at that. Um, STL, OBJ, STEP. So they, they do take a variety of files. You can see the other options here. Now we can tell them what we've used in our design, whether it's millimeters, inches, centimeters, whatever units we've used in our design. And we can choose our material. Uh, these materials have specific properties. You might want to go through which ones you need, do a little bit of research beforehand. One of the most popular is PLA. And the reason for that, you can have different colors, right? You can choose white, black, yellow, red, green, blue. Some of the other ones are, that are very popular are P-Tag. It's only black and white. Um, ABS, only black and white. Uh, you get nylon. It's black with spray painting. And you can have resin. It only comes in matte white, but there's all sorts of different resins depending upon your actual mechanical needs. And you can even go to metals. So then you go on and you define your other parameters. So I think I'll probably, for mine, I'll just leave it as white. Nobody's going to see inside the cabinet anyway. Here we go. So down here we can see what PLA is all about. So PLA and also known as FDM is used for low cost, non-functional prototyping. Offers great, greater detail than ABS, but is more brittle, unsuitable for high temperature applications. Again, I think it's going to be fine for a card cage. I mean, all it has to do is help me guide the cards down into the slots. It doesn't, it has no, uh, mechanical requirements to it or temperature requirements or anything like that. So for my purposes, that would be fine, but you need to, you need to determine what you're going to be using it for. Uh, do you want part marking on it? If you do, are they silk screen or laser engraving? Parts assembly? No. Assembly tests? Ship on, in assembly? And then just uh, acknowledge that you understand certain things that, you know, if your wall thickness is, is not thick enough or if you're non-standard printed threads, you need to just click on these things and tell them that you're aware of these things and that won't be a problem. Then once you have your order defined and you just go over here 
and submit the request and they'll get back to you with a price on it. So it's that simple. It's amazing the capabilities these guys have. Anyway, let's get back to our project here. And let's have a look at some of the interesting equations for using a time domain reflectometer. So uh, you can see them there on the right hand side. We have distance to fault. This is used to measure the distance to a fault in a cable. The distance, as we can see, is equal to the velocity factor times the speed of light times the reflection time, all divided by two. Now the velocity factor is the ratio of the speed of the signal propagation in the cable to the speed of light. And the reason we divide by two is because the pulse has to travel all the way to the fault and be reflected back again. So we take that time and divide it by two. Now you can figure out the velocity factor. You can see that equ second equation down. Um, by taking a precisely known length of the cable under test and rearranging the above equation so that we have the velocity factor is equal to two times that length divided by the speed of light times the reflection time. For now, let's skip over the sample below and uh, we'll go through these calculations when we get our boards built and we'll do some tests of actual applications with a 50 ohm cable that I use around here. Now, uh, one thing I should note, this output set up here for 50 ohm output and pins. So the four 200 ohm resistors in series will give us 50 ohms. If you were doing twisted pair, which is a, a 100 ohm intrinsic impedance, you would double that. So we'd have 400, 400, 400, 400. That would give you a 100 ohm impedance on the output as well. And again, when, when we get this thing built, and I can show you what I mean by proper loading of a, a system with an intrinsic impedance. So the interesting addition to the time domain reflectometer is the pulse generator. In this particular case, we're going to use a 74 AC02 quad NOR gate. And the pulse is going to be generated by propagation delay through that gate. We're going to have it configured that we could select between a short two propagation delay pulse or a longer four propagation delay pulse. Let's look at the two propagation delay situation. That way we'd have a jumper between one and two here. Let's start off with the case where the oscillator is high. That'd be our starting point. That means the input to this is high, the input to this is high. That means both of their outputs are low. This being low means the buffer is high and if the buffer is high, then the outputs of these are going to be low. So the output of the reflectometer is low when the output of the oscillator is high. So now let's look at the first transition as the oscillator goes low. When the oscillator goes low, the output of this gate goes high. And of course, then that means the output of the reflectometer goes high, so we've got the beginning of a pulse. And this also goes low. So one propagation delay later, the output of this will go high. That will follow the path back up in here, and then another propagation delay later will force the output of this back low again. So we've had a two propagation delay in going from high and forcing it back low again. So once the oscillator goes high again, nothing changes until it transitions low again, and then the same thing repeat. Uh, what happens if we put the jumper between two and three? Well, then we've got four propagation delays. So instead of it being able to come immediately after this one, it's got to go down through this one, adds a second propagation delay. Then this one here adds a third propagation delay, and then it comes back up, back into this gate again, and then a fourth propagation delay later, the output here will drop. Okay, so that's basically how it's going to work. Now, I'm not 100% sure what we're going to get um, with the propagation delays on these. According to the spec sheet, it has a minimum of around about one nanosecond and a maximum of around about 6.5 nanoseconds for the five volts that we're going to be using. So it's going to be somewhere in between there. Typically, they give a value of around about four. So we could look that the two propagation delay will have a pulse with at its base of approximately eight nanoseconds. And the four propagation delay would have around about 16 nanoseconds. We'll see when we build it. So, so let's go on over and have a look at, at the layout for the board. It, it, it's also pretty similar to what we did with the uh, fast rise time oscillator. So here we have the board and this is the top part of it. So we have, again, we've managed to put all the traces on the bottom. So we have a, a, at least one complete ground plane. And so the top layer is bonded to ground. 
And that should help with eliminating noise and reducing some of the inductance in the traces. If we go back to the bottom here, you can see how we've laid things out here. So on this side over here where we need the speed, everything has got very, very thick traces. Over here on the pulse generator side, we don't need as thick traces. We're not so concerned about how pretty or how fast that rise time, fall time, uh, the internals of the pulse generator are concerned. We're more concerned on the propagation delay within the chip. And this whole contiguous ring around this thing, this, this copper pore here is the positive five voltage. By making this thing contiguous all the way around, which is a very, very, very low impedance connection to the five volts, just like the ground plane does for the ground. So this thing should have fairly decent performance. So let's have a quick look over here at what I'm talking about as far as uh, pulses and all that are concerned. So let's, uh, here we go. So this is, uh, this is a, a hand-wired prototype of a time domain reflectometer that I made. It's got about 129 inches of cable on it. And this is what the sort of thing you're looking at. So this is the initial pulse that comes out. And then some time later, you get a reflection that comes back. And you measure the time between them. So that's 35.9 nanoseconds. And then you can punch that into our equation that we showed over here. So let's assume a velocity factor of 0.7 and the speed of light being what it is. I mean, that's not precise, but it's close enough for this demonstration. And that time is 35.5 nanoseconds. We'll see that uh, the distance is 0.7 times 3 times 10 to the 8 times 3.55 times 10 to the minus 8 divided by 2. And this is in meters, so it turns out to be 3.7. And uh, that's almost precisely the length of that cable. I might have the velocity factor wrong, but that's one of the things we're going to do uh, when we get the, the boards in from PCB way. We'll build one up and we'll, we'll test the velocity factor of that cable. We'll come up with a, a far more accurate calculation for its length. Anyway, folks, thanks for joining me today. That's it for now. It's enough theory. So join me for when the boards come back in and we'll make sense of all this with some actual real live time domain reflectometry.